Welcome to Climate Watch. I'm Ben Tracy. In this episode, we bring you stories of how climate change is impacting food and farming, from what we eat to where it's grown to how it's raised and harvested. We'll take you to Alaska, where the snow crabs have disappeared. They had to cancel the harvest season for the first time ever. And we'll introduce you to a vegan enthusiast who says she was an unlikely culinary convert. But we begin with an already visible sign of climate change's impact on crops in the U.S., as some farmers are now growing citrus fruit in a place you wouldn't expect, in a piece that first aired on Sunday morning. The most unusual thing about Joe Franklin's 78-acre citrus farm is that it really shouldn't be here. When I first started with it, people couldn't believe me when I told them it was grown right here in Georgia. They didn't believe me. Oh, now you, don't can't, you can't grow that here. But Franklin now has 12,000 trees growing fruit in the middle of Georgia. Grapefruit, Meyer lemons, tangos, gold nuggets, satsumas, Georgia kisses, bingos. You'd normally expect to find hundreds of miles south in Florida. So I'm not going to find a Georgia peach anywhere on this land? <laughs> no, probably not. One of the main things that drove my decision to plant them was the fact that it is so much warmer now than it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I know when I was growing up, golly, in October, you always had a couple of frosts. In November, you usually had a freeze. That doesn't happen anymore. Did you think of that as climate change, or did you just say something's different here? No, I thought of it as climate change. And it's, it's happening. I mean, there's no doubt about it. A month of rainless days and temperature above 100. Farmers have always dealt with the whims of Mother Nature. But now climate change is changing what they can grow and where they can grow it. Like everyone knows, of course, there's global warming, but then what does it mean? So Himanshu Gupta is the CEO of San Francisco-based startup Climate AI. Their platform uses machine learning to identify climate risks for food companies and farmers. The stakes are high. Worldwide, its estimated crop yields could decline up to 30% by the year 2050, as the planet warms and climate change fuels more severe drought and flooding. A lot of crops, uh, not just in the U.S., but also in Africa, India, are already seeing the impacts of climate change. If we move into the future, these areas will have a significant shift. Gupta showed us how the cranberries on our Thanksgiving tables will likely have to be grown significantly further north in the coming decades. It's going to be riskier in a lot of places to grow certain crops in the future, but this is helping mitigate some of that risk? Absolutely. And using that, you can tailor your recommendations uh, for the food companies or seed companies or for farmers. Dramatic shifts are already happening. There's now coffee from California and fine wines from England. But while warmer temperatures may benefit some crops, they can devastate others. In Georgia, the state's famed peach trees require significant winter chill in order to bloom come spring. So this is uh, one of your weather stations? Yes, we have 89 stations across the state. Pam Knox is an agricultural climatologist at the University of Georgia. She says winters here have warmed on average more than three and a half degrees since the 1800s, enough to put many varieties of peaches at risk. Researchers are racing to develop new warmer weather varieties to take their place. As warming continues, should we expect crops to kind of migrate north in some fashion, things that needed to be further south in the past? There will be some migration. There's some limitations to that. The kind of soil you have, whether you have access to irrigation, what you've grown traditionally, because if you're a peach producer, you're probably not going to suddenly switch to cattle. Joe Franklin's bet is paying off, but he knows a changing climate likely means more losers than winners. For this to be working here means it's probably not working so well for somebody further south. Right, exactly. Do you think about those folks? I do, and I feel for them. And it's a gamble, it's a risk you take, you know? It's one of them things. Coming up, the mystery of Alaska's missing snow crabs. We take you now to Alaska, where a delicacy is disappearing, along with the livelihood of fishermen who have lived and worked there for generations. 
an estimated one billion snow crabs have inexplicably vanished over the last few years, resulting in Alaska's Department of Fish and Game canceling the 2022 winter snow crab season in the Bering Sea. Jonathan Vigliotti explains. Autumn is a time for stocking up on Alaska's Kodiak Archipelago. Its famous namesake bears feast on a buffet of salmon ahead of winter. And in the nearby fishing port, one of the largest in the country, Gabriel Prout and his family had mapped out crab season. We'll leave our slip here in Dog Bay, Kodiak, Alaska, head out around Spruce Island. But the odds of Prout's ship ever leaving his slip are now slim to none, which could also be said about the snow crab population that makes up most of his business. An estimated one billion crabs mysteriously disappeared in just two years. That's a 90% plunge. Where have the snow crab gone? Did they run up north to get to that colder water? Did they completely cross across the border? Did they walk off the continental shelf on the edge there of the Bering Sea? We don't know. The first reaction was, this, is this real? You know, we looked at it was almost a flat line. As a researcher with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Let's see what we've got for crab. It's Ben Daly's job to monitor the health of the state's fisheries, which produce 60% of the nation's seafood. His team is now investigating where the crabs have gone. But we're trying to look for causes. Uh, disease is one possibility. Daly also points to climate change. Alaska is the fastest warming state in the country and is losing billions of tons of ice each year, critical for crabs who need cold water to survive. Environmental conditions are changing rapidly. We've seen some warm conditions in the Bering Sea the last handful of years, and we're seeing a response in a cold adapted species. So it's pretty obvious that, that this, is, this is connected. We need a rapid relief financial program to get us through disasters like this, much like farmers get during crop failures or communities get soon after a hurricane or flood. What does a person do whose life is dependent on the ocean when the ocean stops giving? Hope and pray. Hope and pray the snow crabs return and his way of life continues. From the deep sea creatures of Alaska to the common cow, there's an unexpected connection that lies beneath the surface of the ocean. Here's former CBS News climate specialist Jeff Birardelli. The miracle cure for climate change is right there in that tub. Yeah. <laughs> Nature. Yeah. Nature has a solution. Yes, yeah, always mm -hmm. to every problem. Mm -hmm. Just we're not paying enough attention to it. From the moment you meet Joe Dorgan, it's clear he's quite the character. He stumbled upon what is nothing short of a climate miracle. The seeds of which were planted through five generations of family farming along the shores of Prince Edward Island, Canada. Back then, farmers harvested seaweed for feed and fertilizer. This is stuff here, prime stuff. This is what's used. We don't take nothing out of it. We don't put nothing into it. This is the cure for everything that ails anything or anybody. While beachgoers may consider seaweed a nuisance, Dorgan knew from experience it was teeming with potential. So he sent samples of it to Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia to test for organic certification. Turns out the high uptake of natural vitamins and minerals in seaweed drove up reproduction and milk production in cows. Joe knew instinctively that seaweed would be healthy for cows, but what came next was a big surprise. Research revealed an unintended consequence. Seaweed made cows less gassy. They found out that feeding this to the cattle would reduce the greenhouse gases by as high as 40%. Ruminants like gassy cows have been labeled climate villains, but not because of what comes out the back. You see, cows have a very unique way of digesting roughage, requiring extra digestion and boosting burps. Those burps emit methane, a heat-trapping greenhouse gas that's 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. In a year, a cow emits as much greenhouse gas as a small car. So with animal numbers now skyrocketing to help feed a growing human population, livestock accounts for 15% of global emissions. 
That's the challenge that motivated scientist Rob Kinley, who worked with Joe on his organic certification 15 years ago, to find a seaweed species with even more methane reducing power. We started testing seaweeds from coastal Australia and it wasn't long before the Asparagopsis species showed up and it showed up in a big way. So big that we didn't even believe what we were seeing. It took multiple runs of testing this before we believed what we were seeing, which was we couldn't find methane anymore. You heard right. Kinley's research showed Aspergopsis, a common type of red seaweed, has the potential to virtually eliminate methane emissions from livestock. But there are some obstacles to overcome. First, it's not easy to harvest it from the ocean, so scientists are experimenting with farming it. Kinley's team, along with others like Josh Goldman, are getting much closer to perfecting the techniques. The way that it shifts the ruminant function in the cow also makes the animal more energy efficient. Goldman is encouraged by the seaweed's versatility. He says cultivation only takes about 90 days, allowing for multiple cycles per year. And it can be grown by aquaculture operations almost anywhere, as long as the climate is suitable. Is there any way to do it for the 1.5 billion cows on Earth? I mean, that's a big lift, isn't it? There are a lot of mouths to feed, but the good news is we only need to feed those cows 0.2% of their daily ration. Still, there's the challenge of encouraging cow owners to use the seaweed supplement. For that, Goldman says there's incentive. That's because adding seaweed to a cow's diet means they consume less food. And he says dairy farmers and cattle ranchers will likely be able to cash in, selling carbon credits for the emissions they reduce. If we were able to eliminate almost all methane from almost all cows on Earth, how big of an impact would that have? It would have a tremendous impact, roughly equivalent to eliminating all the emissions from the US or the equivalent of taking every car off the road globally. That's a long way off, but then again, Kinley's work has come a long way since his initial discovery 15 years ago. You seem very optimistic. I am optimistic. As for Dorgan, he's nearly retired, but his work with seaweed continues. So you didn't set out to be a climate hero? No, no, never crossed my mind. I want to be who I am. An everyday guy whose impact on the planet is anything but ordinary. While scientists are optimistic, critics point out this hasn't yet been tested at scale and some fear seaweed could stop being effective if cows' stomachs adapt to it. Up next, taking a bite out of plastic waste. An estimated 34 million pounds of plastic waste was sent to U.S. landfills in 2021. Now some companies are encouraging consumers to ditch single-use plastics for edible alternatives. CBS's Naomi Ruckham has more. For catering business, Bartleby and Sage, their famous mac and cheese is always a hit. What makes the dish so special? It's served on a spoon you can eat. So we're talking mac and cheese with five cheeses on a cheese flavored spoon. Yes, so you kind of have to love cheese. <laughs> I do. All right, cheers. cheers. Boston area company Edibles by Jack makes the spoons, which come in 18 flavors from savory to sweet. People are choosing these products because the client themselves want something sustainable, want something fun that elevates their menu. And the caterers believe they serve up a double dose of delicious and practical. We were an early adapter because we just thought that was a great way to serve the food and you can also eat the spoon and then your waiters don't have to go around picking up the dirty spoons. Other brands around the world are launching their own innovative ways to bite the utensil that feeds you. These edible straws from Sorbos are completely biodegradable and last in cold drinks for up to 40 minutes. The water is definitely still water, but the happy little aftertaste of the strawberry, it's like candy. Italian coffee maker Lavazza has made an espresso treat that comes in an edible cookie cup. And a company called Incredible Eats sells spoons and forks with flavors like chocolate, vanilla, oregano chili, and black pepper. Not bad. Like a cracker. You'll have to fork out extra cash for an edible utensil priced from 25 cents each to more than a dollar. Compare that to standard plastic ware, which costs as little as four cents a piece. Is it something you would pay extra for? Mm, maybe, yeah. 
And while an edible spoon may not replace your plastic one just yet, the hope is to take a small bite out of climate change. We close now with a way of eating that can become a way of life. It might not be for everyone, but consuming less meat and experimenting with a plant-based diet is more popular than ever. In a story I first reported for CBS Sunday Morning, we get food for thought. Did you ever think you'd be making jackfruit <laughs> tacos for your lunch? Uh, absolutely not. Four years ago, I didn't think I would have been vegan. Who knew? If you were looking for someone to spread the gospel of plant-based eating, ain't that something how life can change? Tabitha Brown would have been an unlikely messenger. What was the kind of food that you grew up on? Honey, <laughs> I grew up on everything. I'm not from North Carolina, child. <laughs> I didn't eat a little bit of things I should not have eaten. A lot of fried food, a lot of pork and beef, chicken, of course. So what did you think of vegans? I honestly thought that's for white people, particularly white women who do yoga and maybe they're in a cult. <laughs> But it doesn't tell thought. It's just a way of thinking. Tabitha Brown now believes giving up all animal products and going vegan herself is what finally ended her bouts of chronic pain and fatigue. Hello there. But she never, never could have imagined what would also happen. And boy, did things happen. I could have never dreamt this or thought of this. Let's make some. She took her daughter's Why advice and started and posting videos on TikTok. Ooh, baby. A healthy mix of what to eat. I'm about to make carrot bacon. Seasoned with a dash of how to live. Even if you can't have a good one, don't you dare go messing up nobody else's hand. The videos have racked up millions of views. She now has a best-selling book, Feeding the Soul, and several corporate partnerships. My goal is not to judge anyone or force my lifestyle on anyone. My goal is simply to share what it did for me. And representation matters, right? So now when people think of vegan, they also think of a black woman with afro, okay? <laughs> Just 5% of U.S. households are vegan or vegetarian. But these days, there are plenty you might call plant curious. Many omnivores are now swapping out some meat for vegetables. Make you dance a little bit. In a diet <laughs> often called plant-based. That's really good. Or even. It doesn't taste like fruit at all. Flexitarian. Plant-based eating is a huge trend. Marie Moldy is a food trends analyst at Data Essential. She says about 25% of Americans now eat a flexitarian diet, and that plant-based is one of the fastest growing terms on restaurant menus. A lot of that is thanks to plant-based meat alternatives. Beyond and Impossible Burgers have proven it's possible to make plants taste like meat. Innovation now spreading throughout the supermarket. Name any animal protein or animal product and now there's a plant-based alternative. 71% of consumers have tried a plant-based meat and more than half say they're willing to pay more for it. There really are two major reasons why people are turning to plant-based foods. The first is health. And the second reason, and this is a major one, is that plant-based eating is thought to be better for our planet and better for the environment. Global food production produces a third of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions contributing to climate change. And raising animals for food, especially cows, accounts for nearly twice as much planet warming emissions as plant-based foods. No one wants to be told what not to do. They want to be given a solution. Ross Mackay is the co-founder and CEO of Daring Foods, a company creating plant-based chicken products headquartered in California, far from Mackay's native Scotland. They kicked me out when I stopped eating Scotch beef. <laughs> I, I gave up eating red meat, but I still eat a ton of chicken. Yeah. Are you trying to convert people from real chicken to this? Our mission is, of course, to rethink chicken from the food system. How do we do that? We go after the chicken lover. It's to go after you. The average American eats about 100 pounds of chicken every year. That's 8 billion chickens, mostly raised in large factory farms. Daring's chicken product is made from soy protein. This sounds ridiculous to say, but tastes like chicken. And designed to replicate the texture of the real thing. That really does have the same texture and taste as chicken. This is almost like skin. Daring launched its first product into the already crowded alternative chicken market less than two years ago. 
It's now in more than 6,000 retail stores. So what is the chicken product you feel like you need to come up with to really disrupt this market? The chicken cutlet is very much the holy grail of chicken. From an innovation perspective, it's the toughest to go after, but we're at the first innings of, of, of this. We barely just getting started. But Ron Neusbacher wonders, what if we just simply enjoyed eating our vegetables? People want real food, and real food should just be, be real food and not pretend to be something that it's not. He's the founder of Shuk, a chain of Israeli street food restaurants in Washington, D.C., where the food, including their famous Shuk burger, is proudly plant-forward. So the objective is to reconnecting people with the plant world and eating more vegetables and grains and seeds, then why go through all this effort to hide it as something different? Our philosophy is to do exactly the opposite, is to actually demonstrate to people experientially that the cauliflower can taste amazing. Newsbacher says protecting the planet for future generations is his motivation to put plants at the center of our plates. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News, available across all platforms. Thanks for watching Climate Watch. I'm Ben Tracy.